thank you all for joining us this morning. Hey. Thank you. We're into February and we're in nice, sunny, warm Hawaii and not in cold, freezing Texas, which we'll touch on in a minute. We have the honor of having with us Professor Vanalia Randall, one of the leading experts anywhere on race and the law. Professor Emerita from the University of Dayton School of Law. We have Ben Davis, Professor Emeritus from the University of Toledo School of Law. And the leading expert on just about anything Ben is willing to talk about. <laughs> Fortunately for us, equally proficient as a ubiquitous universal expert on all topics is Jeff Portnoy, among them the First Amendment here in Hawaii. So how many points? How many points in Scrabble is ubiquitous? <laughs> I think it's. I'm 20. a little word person, so I don't know nothing <laughs> about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, my guess would be upper twenties, maybe thirties. I'm assuming gonna... that's a compliment, by the way. It's it's way too many syllables for me to understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, yeah. It Did is. you learn that? Did you learn that in Tiny Town, Texas? <laughs> no, I'm an English major, bachelor's, <laughs> bachelor's and master's. And then I went to law school to unlearn English, and then I came out of law school to relearn. So, yeah, perfect. So one of our viewers asked, hey, what's our take on what's going on in Texas? Hey. Uh, your people are from there originally. All my family is in Texas, from from the uh, all down in Houston, on the other side of Houston, near the border, all the way up to Amarillo, Texas. You can get on the highway, and I had to stop at every major city. So both of my families live in Texas and small towns, uh, and they're doing okay. I just talked with some of them, and they're doing fine, but. The Texas problem, everybody kind of like, oh, this is an unanticipated storm. No one could have prepared for it. Well, it happens every 10 years. I live, you know, Texas has a big frozen storm that hits Houston and goes all the way up the highway about every 10 years. Doesn't want to spend the money to fix the system so that they don't have these problems. So, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not unexpected. Uh, it may be worse than they've ever seen, but frozen cold weather in Houston happens. So we, we sort of have the reversal of the prior administration problem where they, the national response comes in to help with the failure of local preparedness and response, which was exactly the opposite for the last four years, including with COVID, masks, precautions, vaccines, everything. So what does that tell us, if anything? Is there a moral to this story? Well, there's uh, someone told me that uh, there was a few years ago, there was some kind of uh, problem, some other part of the United States and folks in Texas had uh, uh, stickers on the back of their cars, bumper stickers saying, let them freeze in the dark, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then I think wasn't it a couple of weeks ago, they were talking about seceding from the union, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, well, okay. You really got to take care of the people, no matter how stupid the leaders are. I'm going to say it like that. Um, there are people hurting. We got to do what we got to do. One of the nice things I heard a comment made that, you know, it's not an administration that's distinguishing between red and blue states, so to speak, um, in terms of trying to do something to, to help out. But uh, the, fund the fundamental problem is, uh, you know, you if you don't do the winterizing, Winner's a problem. You know what I mean? I mean, it really is. And I don't, you know, I understand that the theory down there is to do it on the cheap, basically. And they that's, do it on that's, the very cheap. Do it on the very cheap. Well, this is what happens when you do it on the very cheap. Any I mean, state, just, any state which elects the Ted Cruz's of the world <laughs> deserves what happens to the state, not to the people. And I just read... Senator Cruz, of course, we all know, went to Cancun. His, his explanation is 
is unbelievable. His explanation is that his daughters had already planned a spring trip to Cancun. And as a, quote, good father, close quote, he decided to take them down there himself. Because his adult daughters or whatever can't Right, go. right. Well, you know, right. part of, in terms of politics and, and things, it seems to me that, that on a national level, we help people when they are in trouble. We, ha we have to. That, that's the only way. But we also have to say to states, yes, okay, when you, you know what? You are going to upgrade your electric thing. That is not a choice. Once you come out of here, you're going to do just like I'm, I'm going to tie this into the voting rights. Just like I think that we could say to state, you can do whatever you want in your local and state elections. But when it comes to the federal elections, these are the standards. And of course, we've got to be able to assure from state to state that people are treated the same in Mississippi as they are in Oregon or Hawaii. We could do the same thing in terms of disaster money is sort of saying, look, you know what? We're, gonna, we're not going to back out when you're in the middle, but we're going to put some requirements on you uh, so that this doesn't happen again. I think the irony is that a state that is so dependent on oil and gas and tells the rest of the country and its politicians about global warming being a hoax and alternative energy being not necessary. What happened? How with all that oil and gas did their power grid be unable to handle the necessities of the last few days? I find it laughingly ironic. Of course, they're well, blaming it, of course, on the frozen windmills. Well, they want, you know, the, the Republican governors don't want to spend money. They don't want to tax people. I mean, it's sort of like people being against taxes is sort of like saying, uh, I'm not going to fix up my house because I don't have enough money. I, I don't have enough money because I'm not going out and getting that job that I need to be able to bring the money in. Taxes is the money we bring in to fix the house up. Mm. And, and if you don't fix the house up, it comes back to haunt you. And that's what's happening in Texas. I'm only it's against cheap for a long time. I'm only against taxing the wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> that's that is such a high noble, noble spirit. Well, I moved to Texas for three years and I moved to Fort Worth, Texas in 2000. And uh, I was in a taxi and I was talking to a taxi driver or I was talking to somebody and they, and they were explaining them what tax is about. And as one business person said to another one, well, Texas is a pay to play state. <laughs> uh, yeah, that helps you understand Texas, pay to play, that's it. Meanwhile, while, you know, while we were last on, we have watched the second impeachment trial. Yes. And the, the foregone conclusion that we all knew about and we talked about two weeks ago and I'm interested in your thoughts. Is was it worth it? Was it was it worth it um, to spend three days listening to folks trying to convince their colleagues, knowing that they had very little chance of convincing enough? My own view is, I think, for the public who spent time watching, it was quite interesting. Yeah. But the more important thing is the aftermath, which was Mitch McConnell's speech. And then our former president now finding a new pinata to attack. <laughs> and I'm, I'm enjoying it tremendously. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, 45th as he likes to be called. He doesn't like to be called former president. <laughs> Yes, right. <laughs> Former human being, maybe. So, but, and we'll get right back to that, but 
Fernando, you also touched on something that really strikes a nerve, and that is when I was a kid growing up, my favorite U.S. history teacher, an older lady from a little town outside of Madison, Wisconsin, <laughs> taught us history. And I talked to her one time and, she, and I said, what's the best thing about the U.S. in history? And she said, whenever there's a disaster anywhere in the world, war, poverty, natural disaster, we're the first ones there with the most to help recover. <clears throat> and that stopped. <clears throat> right after the American war in Vietnam, when Nixon, Kissinger, and McNamara developed a policy and sent McNamara to every embassy and every international financial organization to say, turn off the faucet for Vietnam, nothing, no humanitarian aid, no nothing. Fortunately, the Scandinavians were not tuned into that particular channel and didn't pick up on that. Eventually, most of the rest of Europe and some of the rest of the world got on board with that. We were the last. We kept an embargo in place for 20 years after the end of the war. And one of the impacts of that was that it forced Ho Chi Minh, whose strategy was to play the Russians off against the Chinese and ally with the U.S. and the West after the end of the American War. In fact, their constitution was based the preamble on the U.S. Declaration of Independence. And he was a scholar in that, in, in France. Anyway, long story short. Where are you going with this? <laughs> we're, we're coming back. <laughs> forced Vietnam into an alliance with Russia, and it alienated us from the most important relationship that we had spent decades developing and would be incredibly invaluable to us now. So the foreign policy reflection and lesson is following exactly from, if you take the short-term vindictive Mitch McConnell Trump approach, you will do long-term harm, both domestically and foreign. And we are no longer known for being the country who comes to people's aid in times of disaster if we ever was known that. I mean, I think that, I think that it's, that we, as a country, we tie our foreign aid. We try to cut, we, we, we do foreign aid in a way, but we, and, and I speak not, this isn't my area of expertise, but it just seems for me, from an observation point of view, that even when we come to the aid of people, there's always some uh, underlying policy that promotes some underlying policy. Because we, we allow other countries that are in severe disaster to go quite a long time in history, looking back over time. How about... Uh, Ben, Jeff, what do you think? Well, you know, my dad used to work for USAID back in the okay. day. Okay, so yeah. And, and so one of the things about foreign aid, uh, when they would go up to the hill, would be that the people would say, well, you know, why don't you spend money in, on our district as opposed to these foreigners overseas? And so what they used to do was they used to list the number of companies in that congressman's district that were getting some of that foreign aid money because the, the money would be spent with U.S. companies. And so they, you know, all of a sudden there was like, oh, this is actually something that in helping those folks overseas is actually helping back in my district. You know, kind of like the Defense Department setting up uh, uh, contracts where their, uh, you know, production facilities happen to be in all the key districts and all that. So that helps. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's part of the, the strategy. Um, and we got to say that, you know, American, I, I would like to say that I think we'd all would agree that American foreign policy, for as long as we can remember, is a very, very complicated sort of uh, pro, uh, series of uh, ostensibly for principle, ostensibly for, uh, what do you say, ostensibly for uh, you know, the better, the better angels in us. And then you find out underneath 
that it's not so clear. I mean, we can go back to the Spanish-American War, right, in 1898 and all that stuff and Manifest Destiny and, and, and how that all worked out. Obviously, it was World War I. I'm not going to say anything against that or World War II. My dad fought in World War II. That was incredible what we did in, in those settings. Uh, but things, you know, those are the world wars. But, you know, the interests that are being uh, protected uh, by the U.S., are you know it, it's not as all clear as uh, as we would like it to be. That being said, we're just like every other state in that sense. You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. you look around, yeah. you know, you're looking for an angel among states. You're not going to find one. You're not going to find one. You just, you know, they states do their interests, and the, you know, the French with their former colonies, or the British with the Commonwealth, whatever. You know, there's always they're always looking for their angle. Uh, for the for their own advantage. Yeah, and I think Renelia, that's exactly right. What was called by USAID and others exporting democracy, democracy was really just an American variant of exercising subordination and control. But let's get back to Jeff's question about impeachment. What does that tell us about the two party system? What? Which two parties? <laughs> <laughs> Because there's about ready to be a third party, probably within the next month, with all the media reports of the so-called rational conservative Republicans who are seriously talking about a center-right party. Um, I think the Democrats are split. I think, you know, there's a far left, quote unquote, portion of the Democratic Party, and then there's a center left. I think the whole aspect of political parties is very interesting this time around. I'm not sure where, you know, it's been what, really since 1912, that there's been any serious effort to come up with a third party. We've yep. had a few over the years that have, you know, Ross Perot and and others that have done, Rain Ralph party. Nader, who have just created problems. But I think the way this country is divided right now, people say it's divided in half. I think it's divided in quarters. Yeah. See, I think it's a party of one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So where does Mitch I think there's on? only one party in the United States, and that's the capitalist party. Like <laughs> the communist party, we have a capitalist party. Like the communist party in China, the Communist Party has a lot of branches. And so when they have elections, they got people running on different branches of one party. We have the same structure. And I'm, I'm serious about this. We have a capitalist party. You cannot get elected. You cannot run in this country if you're socialist. You cannot, you, the, 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 there is no room for anything but capitalism. Bernie would and disagree that, with you. Bernie would disagree with you. <laughs> yeah, well, Bernie has spent the last, <laughs> me and Bernie are the, about the same age, uh, in the same age group. And Bernie has spent the last years kowtowing to the Democrats because there's no capital, no, no socialist party. Well, well you, Bernie, you know, the, fun, the funny thing is that in America, if you say anything that vaguely is sort of, uh, what is it? Uh, social oriented, you're called a communist. I mean, I find that amazing <laughs> that, 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 you know, that, you know, somebody talks about universal health care, they're talking about it's a com you're a communist. And I'm like, I lived in France 17 years with universal health care. And we're you beyond know? that. They don't call them communists anymore. There aren't any communists left. Now they well, call them socialists. That's okay, not that, socialist. you know. <laughs> but, you know I, I just find that kind of amazing how the, you know, I've, I've been watching the, you know, the, the, the various debates and discussions, how people just go to go to that old communist rag about things that I found, you know, really quite normal and even kind of healthy, you know, I mean, that uh, you could get your medical care taken care of, you know, and you had taxes to pay and all that. But, you know, those communist countries like Canada and I don't know. Sweden, you know, I mean, it's like, I, don't, I can't believe it. It's just how people no. just get bitten by that. Well, let's talk uh, about the big issue right now, which is, you know, Biden's 
political statements throughout the campaign about bringing the country together, working across the aisle, and the reality of the last three weeks going into today, just dealing with COVID, forget about anything else, and the relief package, which looks like he's going to have to impose by using some parliamentary uh, a rule of the arcane Senate. Um, yeah. What do you think about that? Because he's getting a lot of criticism because he set himself up for the criticism. Sure did. Uh, you know, he, I think he, it, it worked for him. He got elected, right? He got elected. And yeah, remember, but now what? Now what? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, remember, a politician's promises only bind those who believe them. Okay, that's the first thing. That's what you I sound like a saying. communist. You sound like no, a communist. I learned that from a, a, a right wing a former president of France said that he was never, he was quoted as saying that you never heard him say it live. So oh, then you're you a know, fascist then a fascist. No, I, I don't know what I am, but I love that it freed me from being caught up by the 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 words that were said and you just see what the actions are, right? So if he's got to do reconciliation or whatever it is to be able to get that package through, then he does it that way. But he can't expect Mitch McConnell or anybody to help him out, right? I mean, he can try and talk to him, but, you know, they're not going to help him out. If he doesn't do that, he's going to have, if he doesn't, if the Democrats and him don't say we're going to use whatever uh, uh uh, a process we need to push through the things we promised on. If he tries to do this bipartisan thing, he's going to have the same outcome as Obama. They're going to lose the House and lose the Senate in 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 the uh, midterm elections. Uh, yeah. And and the problem for for me because I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm a radical leftist. Uh, the problem for me is that the Democrats, I think the Democrats' image of themselves is working across the aisle. And so they have as much of, they have problems moving to the left to get things done because they want to have the Republicans agree with them. They are looking for approval. And the Republicans are like, we so far to the right. If you want our approval, you're going to have to come to the right. And, and if they go to the right on all the things they promise, they'll lose the House. But, you know, you watch the impeachment vote. And you see that one third of the country doesn't believe in any of the things we're talking about. The senators from North Dakota and South Dakota and Montana and Wyoming, and I can go state by state by state west of the Mississippi. That's a different America than the coasts and Chicago and uh, tiny town Texas or, you know, whatever. I mean, we, we just can't forget that you know, McConnell, I, I think, has lost control, frankly, which is a, Amazing if that's actually happened, because a third of his party doesn't even believe in traditional Republican values. Mm. They they are caught up in conspiracies. They're mm -hmm. they're mourning the death of one of the most evil people. Sorry, Rush Limbaugh. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, don't it, say his name. I know, but you know, turn on Fox last night, which I did. Yeah, and I did you too. would have thought Jesus died. Yeah, I mean, we have to recognize that a third of the country could care less about the things we talk about, about equality, about police brutality, about clean climate, about whatever. And you look at those Republican senators and you go, wow, they were elected by people. Yep. You know, they weren't anointed <laughs> anyway. And that's well, part really of the important. election, but I don't want to understate the election by people is because the Republicans have 
smartly taken over gerrymandering True. in a lot of the states and yep. and and in that sort of uh, uh and doing things to keep the voting i mean even in states you call true like are maybe over uh, overwhelmingly white most states have large minority populations, a, a, a large enough percentage, and the Republicans in those states do things to marginalize their their uh, the voters. Although I agree with you that uh, in terms of the number, anyway, because hey, Trump got a lot of votes. We keep, you know, we talk yeah. about he got he got right. seventy one million votes. Was that it? That's not a, that's not, you know, and Jeff's that's point not. is a really important one in some respects because the number of people represented by the 57 senators who voted to convict is many, many millions more yeah. than the 43 who voted not to convict. Yeah. So if you're looking at governance, we are so far from one person, one vote from governance by a majority. Two. We are in. We never were lot. that, though. I so mean, part of the whole Senate minutes. was set up to do exactly what it's doing. The yeah. design of the Senate was to make sure that majority, the radical majority, didn't get out of control, and we would have these elitist center senators, you know, uh, in. Uh, race-based states and racist states uh, control what's happening. So I'm just going to say that between now and 20 and 22, you're going to see a lot of laws being put in place to basically ice out the voting of those yeah. who led to those majorities in Georgia and things yeah. like that, particularly minorities and others. But that's what you're going to see because those are, as you can see, the way that the state parties are operating already, where somebody voted against Trump, they got censored like within minutes of their vote, you know? And these are just kind of trying to organize uh, uh, voter suppression minority government. That's all. Minority government, that's all we're watching is happening. And then, you, the, unfortunately, voting rights will uh, are in the process of being diluted or efforts are being put forward to do that so oh you can blame you, the supreme court for that no, oh yeah you, you know shelby county you can get, blame the democrats and the republicans if they don't pass a bill controlling federal elections yeah because none of these states are rich enough to uh run uh, uh, elections, one for the state and one for the federal. And so if the if the federal government would step in and say, you know what, we, we the federal government for president, one vote, one thing, you got control how. I pass a voting right bill, reinstating section five, making any change in in how people vote if, if it's going to have a disparate impact, it's by definition a uh, 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 a racist and 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 has to be uh, and can't happen. But I I have no faith that the Democrats will do that. So that brings us to the end of our time for today. It's a great place to wind up because it's very forward looking. So let's I have to get to Cancun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. With my daughters, my grandson. I'll come back my tomorrow. Your old grandson. And yeah, I'll, I'll come back tomorrow. I just... <laughs> but how do you get to Cancun without being crucified? Oh, hey, I have one very quote good. From... So one of the nighttime show hosts asked Bernie Sanders. He said, "So as an old white guy, how does it feel to be so marginalized?" And on that, <laughs> we'll we'll let you folks go. Come back in two weeks. Join us. Thank you so much. Bye. All right. Bye.